This week we are starting a new series as we walk with Jesus. As we catch up with Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 14, right at the beginning of that chapter, Jesus experiences something that gives him grief. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had been in jail. He had been in jail because, well, he had spoken out against the authorities. Herod had divorced his wife so he could marry Herodias, who was married to his own brother. And John said, this is not a good thing. And so he spoke out against it, and Herod, in his anger, put John in prison. Well, Herodias wanted something more than that. She felt prison wasn't enough. And so, when Herod threw a party, she had her daughter dance. And her daughter so entranced Herod that he said, I will give you whatever you want, even up to half my kingdom. And Herodias told her daughter, ask for him to bring you John the Baptist's head on a platter. So John was beheaded, and his body was taken away and buried by his disciples. John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus. John the Baptist was the one who leapt in his mother Elizabeth's womb when Mary came pregnant with Jesus, the Son of God. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And so in his grief, he decides to get away. But a crowd followed Jesus and his disciples, and as he looked around at this crowd, he saw that they were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And so he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick, and they continued to gather around. And as nightfall came, the disciples said, Jesus, it's time to send these people away. It's time to send them away so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says something very strange. You take care of them. You feed them. And they had to have been a little bit confused. As they looked at a crowd that was numbering 5,000 men plus women and children, and so for argument's sake, if we benchmark that crowd at 10,000, that would be the number nine city in Montana. Ninth largest city in Montana. It would also probably be very comparable for a size of a gathering in the region where Jesus was because there weren't many large metro areas then either. So why would Jesus do this? Why would he tell his disciples to do something that just seems so much of a stretch, so much of an impossibility? Well, as they were walking with him, they maybe thought, okay, this is time for them to put their, their education into action. This is time for them to step up to the plate. This is time for them to leave. But they looked at what they have and they said, we don't have enough. What have been those times for you when you say, I don't have enough? I am not enough. What have there been those times when you forget that, like the disciples, they forgot that they not only had five loaves of bread and two fish, but they had Jesus. What are those times where you put limits on what God can do? What are those times when you put limits on what God can do through you? There are times you say, oh, you know, this is, this is a lost cause. This is hopeless. Nothing's ever going to get better. This isn't going to get turned around. The way things are going, there is just no way this is going to work. And yet, as we've talked, we have a God who makes the impossible possible. And God can turn things around. He can turn hopeless situations into hope-filled situations. He can turn suffering and mourning into joy and happiness. Sometimes we sell ourselves short. Sometimes you look in the mirror and say, I'm too young, I'm too old. I'm just a man, I'm just a woman. What do I know? Or, you know, if you really knew my history, or I don't have quite the, the experience, I don't quite have the gifts or the talents or the abilities. 
And we make up all these excuses, just like Moses did. When, Moses, when God came to Moses to say, hey, you're going to lead my people out, Moses said, oh, not me. I'm not good at talking. Why are they going to listen to me? What proof do I have that you're with me? And God addressed each one of those objections and provided Moses with what was needed for the task. God provides what is needed for the task for us as well. He provided the disciples with what they needed. All they needed were the five loaves of bread and fish and Jesus. And that makes it work. For me, when I uh, graduated from seminary, my first call was to Trinity Lutheran Church in Leavenworth, Kansas. And a big chunk of my call as pastor there, as the associate pastor, was youth ministry. And I was a little anxious. I was a little nervous. Because out of my class of 120 graduates at the seminary, I was probably one of a few, perhaps the only one, who did not have youth ministry experience in their field education or during their internship. And yet I had to become the youth guy. And then I step into a situation where I look around and I see these old people that are there. These parents and these teenagers. I mean, some of them were 40, 50, maybe even 60 years old. Because in my mind, I'm going, well, you need to be in your 20s to connect with youth, right? You know, we, we, we throw that, that thing out there. And yet God did amazing stuff in that new ministry. Over the three years that we were there, God turned our focus outward in our community and created a space where our youth were inviting their unchurched friends to come hang out on Sunday nights. And then some of those friends eventually said, you know, I'd like to be baptized. And they were baptized and they had the opportunity to be confirmed and commit their, themselves to following Jesus. And God did this through an experienced and an inexperienced young pastor. And these old people that were youth leaders. And one of them, I think he was the oldest. I think he might have been in his 60s. He was a meat cutter. And he had a knack for connecting with the hardest to reach kids. The kids that were just had a lot of armor coming in. He had a way of just walking with them, connecting with them. And God did amazing stuff there. And yet I was willing to sell God short. And I'm guessing you also have your stories where you've sold God short. And God has proved you wrong. And yet we continue to try to sell God short. And so what does Jesus do as the disciples say, what are we supposed to do? We only have five loaves of fish, or five loaves of bread and two loaves of fish. He feeds the people. And that's what God does. God feeds people. We go back all the way to the Exodus experience, which is like the stereotype for every family vacation. Yeah. Uh, the disciple, the, 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 the children of Israel, the Israelites, all through the wilderness. It's this chorus of, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, are we there yet? And in Exodus 16, they're, they're complaining. They're saying, you know, if we were back in Egypt, if we were back where we came from, we would, we'd have food to eat. What, what did you bring us out here to starve for, Moses? And so God promises to provide them quail and to provide them manna every day except on the Sabbath. And God provided enough on the day before to tie them over on that Sabbath day. God fed his people. God worked through the prophet Elijah to uh, multiply some flour and some oil for a widow in Zarephath. And Zarephath wasn't even part of Israel. He's reaching outside to those other people and working through his people to bless them. And then Elijah's follower, Elisha, does the same thing in multiplying oil for a widow. And then later on in 2 Kings chapter 4, he feeds 100 people with some loaves of bread. This is what God does. And it's a bit of a about faith in what we find with Herod. Herod is throwing this lavish party with an abundance of food, an abundance of drink. And it ends in death for John the Baptist. Jesus has this gathering of a lot of people and only has a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. 
and he brings out of that scarcity and abundance twelve baskets of leftovers. And he brings life, and he brings hope. As we go to our text, and we find what Jesus does, but before that we also find what God promises for us. In Isaiah 25, God promises that at the end of time, on this mountain, the Lord of heavenly forces will prepare for all peoples a rich feast, a feast of choice wines of select foods, rich in flavor of choice fine wines well refined. God has a meal of the best of the best of the best waiting for all of his people. And yet in the meantime, we have that promise from Isaiah 55 that what God gives is free. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come buy food and eat. Without money at no cost, buy wine and milk. God's just giving things away. Sending it out the door not expecting or being able to receive any payment because there's nothing that we can give. God feeds His people and He does it freely. As Jesus was there in Matthew 14, He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves of bread and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them and broke the loaves apart and gave them to His disciples. Then the disciples gave them to the crowd. We find that same scenario in the Last Supper. As Jesus is celebrating Passover with his disciples. And when they were eating, he took bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. And said, take it eat. This is my body. And that's that meal that we get to celebrate here every Sunday. As God continues to nourish us. And to feed our faith. And yet, Jesus repeats that one more time. In one of his post-resurrection appearances, he's walking on the road to Emmaus with some disciples who are in grief. Their hearts are broken because Jesus died. And they're convinced that everything that they had believed is gone and lost. And Jesus sits down with them at a meal. He took a seat at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed them, broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were open. And then he disappeared. Blessed, broken, and given. As God continues to provide for us and to nourish our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our souls. Nourishing us here at this table, nourishing us in our relationships with one another, and nourishing our bodies as we celebrate lunch after the service. And it's no wonder the psalmist gives us these words in Psalm 107. Let them thank the Lord for His faithful love and His wondrous works for all people. Because God satisfied the one who was parched with thirst and filled up the hungry with good things. Where Jesus' disciples saw an impossibility, Jesus saw an opportunity to do something amazing. Where Jesus' disciples saw what they lacked, Jesus saw an opportunity to multiply what God gives. Where Jesus' disciples saw scarcity, Jesus saw an opportunity for abundance, hope, and life. So he took bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it away. Jesus is the same for us, nourishing us as He speaks to us through His Word, as He gathers us here, as He feeds us from His table, and as He continues to walk with us through our lives. And also He takes us and He blesses us. And in spite of the brokenness of our sin, He gives us as an offering to this world. As He blesses us to be a blessing. Giving us not what we can give, but giving us to give what only He can give. As we have opportunities to connect with our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members, and even complete strangers. And pray for the Holy Spirit to open the doors for us to offer the hope, the life, and the abundance that God gives us in Jesus. 
as we continue walking with Jesus for these this week and the four weeks that follow this. Prepare to have your eyes and ears open to the wonder of what God has in store for you and for me. Amen. Some questions for you to think about. What limits do you place on what God can do? What limits do you place on what God can do? And how has God worked through you to bless someone else? How has God worked for you to bless somebody else? Food for thought. <coughs>